Rex Ureman. I'm an architect. I'm an architectural consultant. I'm a troubleshooter. Born and raised on Long Island. Okay. Been right. working in Manhattan since 1987. After more than a decade, police have finally arrested the man they believe is the Long Island serial killer, also known as the Gilgo Beach Killer. True crime community has been obsessed with this unsolved case, and allegedly so has the guy arrested for the killings, Rex Hewerman. Police uncovered hundreds of searches on his computer about this case. What the defendant was searching, uh, in a 14 month period, he had over 200 searches pertaining to uh, the Gilgo investigation. He was searching, compulsively searching, pictures of the victims, but not only pictures of the victims, pictures of their relatives, uh, and he was trying to locate those individuals. In addition to that, there was a lot of uh, torture, porn, and what you would consider depictions of women uh, being abused, uh, being raped, and being killed. The 59-year-old architect was taken into custody on July 13th at his Midtown Manhattan office and has been charged with the murders of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. The bodies of the three victims, along with one other, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, were found over the course of two days in 2010, within a quarter mile of each other, along a stretch of highway in Long Island. They would become known as the Gilgo Beach Four. Hewerman has been indicted for the murders of three of the victims and is the prime suspect in the fourth. These cases have gone cold for years, but in 2022, a new task force was formed with the express purpose of finding the Long Island serial killer. And at a press conference, police did not mince words when it came to describing the man they arrested. Rex Hewerman is a demon that walks among us, a predator that ruined families, so how did this, quote, predator live and function for all these years without raising suspicion? Well, pretty successfully. Hewerman's arrest came as a huge shock to a lot of people who know him. The Long Island native is an imposing man. He's somewhere between 6'4 and 6'6, weighs more than 250 pounds, but he's been described by several people as being affable. Co-workers even nicknamed him Peter Griffin after the Family Guy character. And a colleague described him to Fox News Digital as patient and goofy, meticulous with his work. Hewerman was the president of his own architecture firm in New York City, so pretty successful, and his 26-year-old daughter Victoria worked for him. At least outwardly, Hewerman appeared to be a family man. He's married, and along with Victoria, he and his wife Asa have a special needs son. Now, not a lot is known about Asa. She's kept a pretty low profile so far. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows describing this guy, trust me. A colleague who wished to remain anonymous told the New York Post that the murder suspect once spoke about the Gilgo Beach killings and allegedly questioned why the murderer would use a burlap net to dispose of the bodies. And a neighbor also told Fox that he was a bit of an oddball. But if you ask law enforcement, Hewerman is as depraved as it comes. I mean, you heard them earlier. They believe he's a predator. And in court documents, they presented evidence that they hope will prove it in a court of law. Here is some of the most disturbing information that investigators discovered while they were digging into Rex Hewerman. A grand jury was convened, and through that grand jury, the LISC task force was able to obtain hundreds of subpoenas. Many of them were to search Hewerman's digital footprint, which police say he tried to hide through fake burner phones and emails. Law enforcement says Hewerman frequently communicated with and hired sex workers, even up until recently. He also had a Tinder profile connected to a burner email where he used a fake name, but seemed to use his real photos. But it was his online searches that are the most disturbing. Cops say the suspect conducted thousands of searches for sex workers, sadistic, torture-related pornography, and child pornography. His search terms are enough to make anybody cringe. Some of them are truly repugnant, and just a warning if you look them up, the content of these searches are very dark. But some of the more mild ones included Mature Escorts Manhattan, but the majority of them involved sexual violence, particularly against young girls. And he also seemed to be obsessed with the Long Island serial killer case. His alleged searches included podcasts and documentaries about Lisk, updates on the case, and why it hadn't been solved. Let me read a few to you. One, why could law enforcement not trace the calls made by the Long Island serial killer? Two, why hasn't the Long Island serial killer been caught? And the last one, in Long Island serial killer investigation, new phone technology may be key to break in case. Now, he also searched the names of the victims and their close relatives and viewed hundreds of photos of those victims, the Gilgo Beach Four. Police said he looked at the images compulsively. 
One of his other alleged searches was for John Bittroff. That's a convicted killer who was once suspected of actually being Liz. Now, the searches were all done in connection with a burner email account, and police say that at the time of his arrest, he had a burner phone on him that was connected to one of those emails. I mentioned earlier that this case had been cold for about a decade and only heated up once that task force was created in 2022 and the Gilgo murders became a priority. Prior to that, there had been widespread criticism of law enforcement and their handling of the case. Now, these victims had all been first reported missing, and investigators are accused of basically putting the cases on the back burner because they were sex workers. A local reporter for the Long Island Press penned this scathing headline a few weeks before the bodies of those missing women would be found dead. Lost girls, when women go missing on Long Island, some matter, prostitutes don't. But once the task force was formed last year, it only took six weeks for Hewerman's name to come up for the first time. And the task force was pretty intricate. Investigators, lawyers, forensics, the FBI, different police departments, all working together to solve this case. But the key to understanding how the task force honed in on their suspect, we have to look at the crimes themselves. Specifically, how were the victims chosen? How did the killer interact with them? How were they killed and then disposed of? And finally, what did the killer do after? The disappearance of 23-year-old Shannon Gilbert was the catalyst to the whole Long Island serial killer case, despite the fact that she isn't believed to be a Lisk victim. Like the other victims, Shannon was a sex worker. In 2010, she traveled from her home in New Jersey with her usual driver, who sort of served as her protection. He brought her to a remote neighborhood in Long Island to meet up with a John. Now, she ends up disappearing under mysterious circumstances. Shannon's case is a complicated one, and diving too deep into it will only serve to really confuse matters as tragic as it was. She did die, likely that night, but her death has been ruled as accidental. But the reason it is significant to the Lisk cases, despite her not being a Lisk victim, is because an off-duty detective was searching for her with his police dog, kind of doing a search exercise. His name was Blue, and Blue alerted him to human remains. That is when the first Lisk victim was found. Now, when that first set of remains was discovered, cops immediately believed that they had finally located Shannon, only they hadn't. The body was identified as another missing sex worker, Melissa Bartholomew. Three more bodies, all sex workers, all petite women, would be discovered the next day in that same area of Gilgo Beach. Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. The victims were all disposed of in the same way. Their bodies were bound at the head, midsection, and feet, and they were wrapped in a camouflage burlap, the type that you would use for duck hunting. The corpses were all in various states of decay, indicating that they were not killed at the same time, but there was physical evidence left on the bodies of these women. At this point, it was clear to law enforcement that they had a serial killer on their hands. Murdering sex workers, unfortunately, is nothing new. Women in this vulnerable community are often preyed upon because their disappearances can go unnoticed or simply ignored by law enforcement and even sometimes their families. But it's important to note here that the disappearances of the Gilgo Beach Four did not go unnoticed by their friends and family. Now, something else they all had in common was not only were they all engaged in sex work, but they were all working independently, advertising their services on places like Craigslist and Backpage, which is how police believe they were first targeted by the killer. And when I say working independently, I mean they weren't working for escort services or a pimp. And when sex workers do work independently in order to protect themselves, they usually have a protocol that they follow and some sort of backup in the form of a driver or someone they pay a little money to to watch out for them nearby. According to the podcast List, who spoke with multiple people connected to the victims, it seems several of the victims broke with their usual safety protocol on the day they went missing. Now, this seems to indicate a level of comfort with the John who had hired them. And there has long been speculation that List was either a high profile member of the community or a member of law enforcement, two groups that would make the women feel comfortable enough to forego their usual safety measures with the assumption that these men wouldn't risk their reputation to harm them. Now, that's clearly not the case with Rex Hewerman. He is most certainly not a member of law enforcement. A more likely scenario is that the killer was either a repeat client who they were already comfortable with, or that they offered them a sum of money they couldn't refuse. Police believe Maureen Brainerd Barnes was killed in 2007, making her the first of the four Gilgo Beach victims. Her body was bound with several leather belts and two female hairs were discovered on one of them. Now, the other victims had been bound by duct tape, and again, female hairs not belonging to the victims were found on two of those victims, and on one, a male hair. Problem was, 
At the time, because of how long these corpses had been decomposing in the elements, the hairs were too degraded to test for DNA. Technology has since caught up and forensic analysts were able to use mitochondrial DNA testing to determine that the female hairs found on the victims belonged to Rex Hewerman's wife. Additionally, one male hair was also discovered on the bottom of one of those burlap sacks, and that was determined to belong to Rex Hewerman himself. Investigators wrote in court documents, it is likely that the burlap, tape, vehicles, or other instrumentalities used in the furtherance of these murders came from defendant Hewerman's residence, where his wife also resides, or was transferred from his clothing. In order to test that mitochondrial DNA from the hair against the Hewermans, people needed to obtain their DNA. Cops had trailed Rex for quite some time once they had set their sights on him as their prime suspect. Police obtained 11 bottles from the trash outside of the Hewermans' home in Massapequa and were able to obtain DNA from Asa, Rex's wife. They ended up getting Rex's DNA off of a discarded pizza crust, which was thrown in its box in a trash can on the street near his office in Manhattan. And according to law enforcement, the DNA tests came back with more than a 96% chance that the samples of hair taken from the bodies of the victims belonged to the Hewermans. Now, if you're wondering why the suspect's wife has not been implicated in the crimes, well, for at least three of the murders, police have evidence that she was either out of the country or out of the state. It's their working theory that the Long Island serial killer was active when his own family was out of town. Now, the DNA matching is obviously damning evidence, but it's certainly not enough. In order for the task force to find Rex in the first place, they used a database that essentially triangulated phone calls that were made to the victims before their disappearance, phone calls made from the victims' phones while they were missing, and phone calls made to the family members of some of the victims after they had disappeared. Way back when the bodies were first discovered and the victims were identified, police learned that the killer taunted the younger sister of Melissa Bartholomew, who was just 15 at the time. The calls were never long enough for police to trace an exact location, but they were able to discover the vicinity where the calls were made. And that's how they learned that the calls were made from a burner phone both in Massapequa and in Midtown Manhattan. And according to law enforcement, they later found out that their suspect exclusively uses burner phones and burner emails to hire and communicate with sex workers, to search for disturbing pornography, and to search for information and updates about the Long Island serial killer case. Law enforcement writes, quote, these burner phones and email accounts with fictitious identities were used in an effort to conceal Hewerman's true identity, conceal his criminal activity, unlawfully proposition sex workers and attempt to monitor the investigation of his crimes. Police also said that the suspect allegedly used a new burner phone for each of the murders. Uh, we also went back and looked at his cell site records and we, were, we, we compared his personal cell site records with that of the four target phones and we saw that there was areas of commonality. So the task force has what they're referring to as an area of interest where these burner phones were being used. They also had a rough physical description of the killer from an eyewitness. That individual was identified as, as a person who was between 6'4 and 6'6, uh, a, a large man thickly built, not necessarily overly muscular, but just a naturally uh, big person with glasses, white uh, and, and dark hair. That eyewitness also identified a very distinctive pickup truck as belonging to the killer. It was an early model Chevrolet Avalanche, and after some digging, police discovered that Rex Hewerman had that exact truck registered to him. Now, if you are at all familiar with this case prior to this recent arrest, you know that the four bodies of the Gilgo Beach victims are not the only bodies that have been found along that stretch of highway in Long Island. Six other bodies were found in the same area between 2010 and 2011, so not long after those first four women were discovered. The way they were found and how their bodies were disposed of doesn't fit the same signature or MO as Lisk. However, those cases are still being investigated in connection with Rex Hewerman. And as I mentioned earlier, he is still the prime suspect in the fourth Gilgo Beach victim's death, Maureen Brainerd Barnes. Police expect that investigation to be wrapping up soon, likely with more charges. But for now, Rex Hewerman was arraigned on three first-degree murder charges and three second-degree murder charges and has pleaded not guilty. According to his lawyer, Rex broke down in tears and told his attorney he didn't do it. Now, despite the long journey it's taken to get an arrest in this case, law enforcement says the investigation is really only beginning now. Trucks of evidence were seen being taken out of Rex Hewerman's Massapequa home, as well as multiple storage facilities belonging to him. 
And it is notable that none of the former victims were found clothed or with their belongings, so those items are out there somewhere. An interior designer who used to work with Rex and went to his home in 2005 to help with a kitchen renovation exclusively told Daily Mail that there was a locked room in the basement, and when she asked about it, Rex was, quote, so weird and allegedly told her it was full of guns. And a source close to the investigation told CNN that somewhere between 200 and 300 firearms were allegedly removed from Rex's home. As for the open investigations into those six victims, also found on Ocean Parkway. Well, I will dive into those next week, so come back for the latest. And for more true crime content like this, hit like and subscribe.